artist, photography, military, and a restless soul are all characteristics of today's guest. Jason Matias, a world-renowned photographer, joins me today as we talk about his unique brand of art, his mindset, and searching for the perfect photo, his time in the military, and so much more, all on today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Welcome to the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Inspiring, motivating, and educating you in finding balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life. Learn from and listen to a man who has a wealth of life experience, from business to bodybuilding, artist to author, and has learned to deal with his own physical and mental wellness. But that's not all. Each week, John interviews and picks the minds of special guests from all around the world and from all walks of life, from actors to authors, wrestlers to warriors, business owners to life coaches, and so much more. Welcome to today's episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. Okay, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls and children and all ages, welcome to another exciting episode of the Mind, Body, and Soul podcast with John Morris. I am your host, and welcome to the show that helps you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day -day life. I am really thrilled and excited for today's show because my guest today, and this is going to be a fairly long intro, folks, and he's deserving of it. He is a photographer. He's an artist. He's the author of the awesome book, Random Thoughts. He's a speaker, a teacher, a former military server, one of six generations worth. He is a man who has got a string of awards that simply follow him wherever he goes. But it's not been all sunshine and roses for this guy because he has known trials and tribulations as well. I think one of the things that I absolutely love about my guest today is that he imagined creating a world where his imagination and reality blended seamlessly and boy oh boy has he done it. He's a guy who's simply got an amazing mind and I want to welcome my special guest today. I hope you get his surname correct. His name is Jason Matias and we want to welcome him. Jason, welcome to the show my friend. How are you doing? I'm, I'm embarrassed. Am I blushing? <laughs> that was a lot. That was a, that's a, a big intro. So, so to answer your question uh, the other day, yes, I have looked you up. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, sorry about that. Uh, Not at all. Yeah, I, I don't even know where to go from there. Like, uh, <laughs> I don't think I don't think awards follow me wherever I go. I definitely am not going to win any hair awards, that's for sure. But I'm hey, for, for wild hair days, you know, that there's definitely, definitely up there. Um, but <laughs> I had a look at your credentials and it was just literally page after page of stuff. And I was like, this is incredible. You know, I mean, some of the things oh. that you've done, you're obviously with uh, TEDx and a variety of magazines and obviously photography, which we're going to talk about today. It, it's, it's amazing. It really, really is. And in such a short span of time as well, it's really incredible. Jason, for the audience that don't know who you are, tell us a little bit about yourself and what it is that you do. Is there anything left to say? <laughs> um, so I'm a, I'm a New Yorker, but I live in Seattle in the US, in the Pacific Northwest. Um, I was in the military, like you said, and I sort of connected with art again while I was stationed in North Pole in Alaska. Wow. And it kind of just was a slow burn. So it's been like a 16 year journey, uh, if you want to call it that, mm -hmm. where I, you know, started with the point and shoot, started just taking pictures and eventually um, tried to make it into a career. And, uh, and I've lived in a whole bunch of places. Um, but I've been here in the Northwest for five years. Before here, I lived in Hawaii, and I was in wow. the desert in Nevada, and then, you know, Alaska, and I'm from New York. Um, I, I do, uh, I have a few like veins of work, I guess you could say. Um, I have the pieces, like the work behind me is, uh, is called, um, this piece is called Concordia and, and this style of landscape photography that I do, I, I build it around this motif called, uh, comfortable isolation. Okay. Where physically I'm looking for a single object in a large, soft, um, landscape, mm -hmm. you know, where I can make that that contrast really stand out. In this case, it's just a row, or one row of the same item, and then this pr pristine sort of long exposure that I did. Uh, the other thing I do is I would show you. I have a loft, and so there's no walls. So there's a I have an aria collection, and um, 
is what I call Aria, and they are these sort of contemporary nudes with a Renaissance style that okay. are based on, uh, they're all named after music, which is why I gave it the name Aria. Each piece is named after a piece of music. And they have these abstractions in them that represent like insecurities and, and then the colors and the songs and the poses are all about duality. And those are really, really different um, mm -hmm. bodies of work. And then I have the book, Naked Thoughts, that, yeah. that you mentioned. So those are those are kind of my areas of, uh, or my domains, I suppose. I don't want to say areas of expertise because <laughs> I'm not an expert at anything. But um, yeah, that, that's where I live. It, it's, oh, and it's, I teach, uh, and I teach a business to artists. I, I was going to say that because obviously, I mean, you and I, you know, I, I didn't actually realize how much we have in common, um, but I found out very quickly we have a lot in common. Um, you know, I'm a professional artist, I enjoy photography as well. Um, I teach folks how to create a successful art business. So there's a lot of things, and I know we've chatted backwards and forwards um, over the last year or so. And, you know, some of the things that I found about you, uh, again, it was, it was eerie. I mean, it really was because one of the pieces of art that I loved the most of yours when you did the TEDx talk, um, all about a series. And folks, if you haven't checked it out, it's on YouTube now. Um, I believe, if I get the title wrong, I do apologize. Beautiful things that no longer exist. Be beautiful things that no beautiful longer Beautiful things that are gone. Beautiful things that are gone. I was close. I was close. close. Um, but it, it really spoke to me because the, 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 photograph of the tree that you did, the tree of fire, um, this beautiful, ginormous, just, just awe-inspiring tree um, leapt out at me. And I, I actually had to pause this and I shouted through to my wife who was making lunch at the time. I said, Katie, you are not gonna believe this. The guy that I'm interviewing this week, he's got this tree. And she said, oh my goodness, that's like your red blossom tree. Now the red blossom tree for me was my signature. It still is even to this day. It's, it's something that sells you know, print wise the most. We've got them all over the world. And I was like, oh my goodness, you know, it was just incredible. And I got so excited about this. Um, you know, it, it was just phenomenal. It really, really was. So there's a lot of things obviously that we're gonna chat about and keeping things moving swiftly on. I got to ask, what was your child life like and what were some of your early influences? Ooh, okay, well, um, I think I found your tree just now. <laughs> if, you, if you Google red blossom tree, John Morris, you'll, you'll find it. <laughs> That's exactly what I did, yeah. Uh, wow, uh, that is really standout. Thank this you. is actually, similar to an idea that I want to produce, which mm -hmm. doesn't answer your question, but <laughs> it's um, okay. I have a, I have like a, an, an intersection of these arias, which, you know, forgive, is this going to be a shared live? Uh, no, it's not shared oh, yeah, live. Yeah. It's all recorded. Well, so we welcome can edit, everybody can, to my Anything rock. that happens here, we can go with it. So that's my aria. One of nice. my arias. It's, uh, I have the camera set to a shadow depth of field. So, ah. um, but they're, they're these nudes, right? So I want to intersect those with landscapes. And one of the designs that I have is going to be of a uh, a large open forest, and then the naiad or or tree spirit or tree god coming out of the the ground. So it'll be a huge wow. tall canopy with no undergrowth, and then a an orange leafed naiad mm -hmm. tree sticking out underneath all that growth with its own like pile of light. Bye, babe. Um, and and this tree is you know how it stands out on its own is pretty similar. Well, it's the whole story of the red blossom tree, because if you notice in the background, it's more grays and it's very subdued and there's just very little color. And it was all about standing out. And the closer you get to, some people just resonate life and light and, and all that kind of stuff when you meet them. And uh, the closer you get to them, the more that you just become infected by their positivity and their excitement and things. And that's kind of the story about the red blossom tree. It's, it's those that stand out that don't necessarily go with the flow or go with the green, but they kind of etch out their own history as opposed to just doing it the way that everybody else has done. Um, so I found that so fascinating that, that that's, that's spoken to you as well. That, that's really cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so you asked me about my childhood. But I mean, I grew up in New York. My father is, is an artist. Um, he has a really interesting story where uh, he just happens to meet people. He just, he's a magnet for connection to other interesting minds. And somehow in New York City, he met a super prominent um, artist from China. 
okay. who is ostensibly the last person to make it out of China before it went communist. Wow. And, um, or the last famous person maybe, or what have you. And that guy traded time with my dad for whatever my dad did for him. Uh -huh. And um, my dad became an excellent uh, pen artist, you know, with the mm -hmm. dots, I figure that yeah, pointillism. Yeah. Yeah. Um, really great. And especially since he doesn't really do it at all because he's a, he's a marine biologist. Mm -hmm. But we grew up knowing that that's, that's what he could do. And so my sister and I uh, were really interested in art. And uh, sometime in junior high, uh, the combination of being told I can't make a career out of this or I won't make money and I shouldn't spend so much time on it and how terrible I felt that art school or art in school was, the experiences that I had with the teachers and whatnot was just horrible. One day a teacher came through and absolutely destroyed one of my pictures because she said the shadows weren't dark enough. Wow. Wow. Um, and, that, and then that was it for me. So I just, I kind of walked away from art altogether and focused on school or joined the military and um, and didn't reconnect with it till I was, you know, 19 or so. Um, I mean, that's the 5,000 foot view. Mm -hmm. Did you happen to read the Why I Create Art? Um, I, I looked at it briefly. I looked at it very, very briefly. Yeah. It was, it, 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 we're about to get real personal. <laughs> go for it. But I feel go like this is important um, for artists. So in the Art of Selling Art- I think art, I know where course, you're going, so go for it. Yeah, in the Art of Selling Art is this, this course I teach. One of the things I talk about a lot is this idea of why. Like, yeah. why do you create? Mm -hmm. So when you ask me about my childhood, that's, that's the real, like, yeah, my dad made art. And yeah, my sister was a fantastic um, yeah. charcoal, black and white. Um, but I had a, an incident when I was a kid. Um, some light molestation, if I can just, yeah. you know, sprinkle it with a little bit of humor. But that really uh, kind of broke me for a while yeah. and caused me to be super isolated in my head mm -hmm. and really bad at relationships and um, interpersonal and romantic and um, sort of con made concrete this idea of being isolated. Yeah. And I didn't really break that apart until my mid 20s. You know, I didn't, I didn't do the, the self work to figure out you know why I was such a dick all the time, and why I couldn't, <laughs> and why why I couldn't do things in relationships that people needed me to do, yeah. um, and and also you know one thing that started popping up was these this recurring uh, boats, mm -hmm. like yachts and and singular boats in my portfolio, and one day someone was like, hey, you have a lot of boats in your portfolio, like these singular boats all by themselves in your images. And I was not focusing on them. Yeah. But then I went back and looked at all the pictures that did contain, you know, a ship of some sort. And I was like, oh, wow, maybe I should focus on that. And, and that became my Lonely Boat series. Mm -hmm. But that was also became the beginning of why do I like this picture? Yeah. You know, why do I like this scene? Why does it call out to me? And from there, I was able to eventually come up with this idea of comfortable isolation, which came from a lot of introspection, a little bit of intersection with my master's degree mm -hmm. and and just a lot of thought. And and now this is basically the only scene I look for. Mm -hmm. So I'm not a super prolific photographer. I don't have thousands of photos and I don't go places to take millions of pictures. Um, I only go to places that are gonna fit this description yeah. and I only take the picture if it does. So. I'm kind of hyper focused on this one idea. Yeah, and I th and I think that's a fantastic thing. I mean, you know, like yourself, you know, when when Katie and I we travel uh, and we love to travel, we love to sample food and you know just to th these amazing places. And a couple of years ago, we we're in Slovenia uh, at Lake Bled, and if you ever get the chance to go there, take it because the the water is just amazing and and so the colors. I I always love for the colors. And a lot of things I do, I do under the tag of the artist heart where, you know, I'm, I'm sharing a piece of myself and, and what I'm, you know, uh, getting and things. And it, to, to me, when, when I look at a photo, it just jumps out and things. And that's, you know, for me looking for that moment. But I really do thank you for, for sharing that about yourself, um, Regan Abuse, because for folks that are regular on the show, they know um, that I, 
you know, obviously do a lot of life coaching and I do a lot of work with folks that have gone through a variety of different areas and a variety of different issues. And I think if I can give any, you know, comfort to, to anybody that's watching this, you know, it, it doesn't matter, you know, whether you are a professional artist, whether you're a speaker, whether, you know, whatever you are, people unfortunately go through these things. And if this has happened or if it is happening, you know, we do want to encourage you to, to, to seek help first and foremost, but make sure you seek the right kind of help um, because some therapists that are out there will just keep you in bondage. Um, and, uh, you know, just, just I think well, have even, that awareness. Even before like, seeking so good for help, Jason. I think you just, even before seeking help, I think you just have to sit and analyze. Yes, that's what we're going to say. Because um, yeah. you know? um, I didn't have help doing yeah. this. And that, I mean, I was in the military when I was doing a lot of these thoughts. So, um, when these thoughts first started so maybe that was kind of discouraged anyway uh, yeah of course but spend time with your own thoughts that's what the comfortable isolation yeah. collection is about um a lot of times like going to your phone or going to someone else to chat or going to the tv those are all just distractions yeah. from living yeah. in your own head and uh, there's a certain degree of living in your own head that is important and useful and and if going for help is a stigma or you're afraid of it, um, first try to just spend some time in your own head and, and just poke at, poke at the beast and see, see what it does. I actually have a, had a conversation with, I end up in these type of conversations all the time. And I had a, fr a conversation with a friend um, who's 50 something and has been dealing with, you know, her past and unraveling it in, in her motivations for a long, long, long time. And, uh, She's been doing it mostly on her own. So mm -hmm. I don't think it's impossible, but um, don't, don't use the idea of finding help yeah. as an excuse not to do the work. Yeah, definitely, definitely. Because I think that's one of the things to, to, to point out to folks as well. You know, yes, like, like we say, you can go and get help. But again, the, the, sometimes they can lead you, you know, and, and give you ideas and things. But like Jason said, it is you that has to do the work. And, you know, if, if you know, if teaching programs that are out there that we've put out there. And one of the things that I teach a lot is, you know, we control our thoughts, we control whatever, you know, uh, feelings that we have. And from our thoughts then lead to our intentions and our intention to our actions it all starts with getting hold of those thoughts. And the only way you can do that is to really go within, you know, like Jason was saying to, you know, to, to have an awareness of what's going on, but it's, it's, it's a difficult thing. And Jason, I want to ask you as well, you know, how did the experience that you had with sexual abuse, whatever you want to call it, shape your view of the world? I, I don't know. Um, I think that's, it, it, I mean, everything is just a contributing factor yeah. to your personality, right? You know, I'm I'm a loner, which could have stemmed from that. Mm -hmm. um, I am a bit wry. My humor is super dry. Uh, and I tend to feel like things don't matter very much. Uh -huh. There's kind of that disconnect that's there. There's a, there's a major disconnect yeah. between, um, between the stimulus and my thought, mm -hmm. you know? And it makes me uh, a bit of a, a super calm thinker. When I was in the military, that mm -hmm. was one of the things that was really useful for me because I could always stay calm. Um, it also makes me super calm in stressful situations like yeah. that should be stressful, um, that should heighten your, your feelings, but don't for me. Um, yeah, it's hard to unravel. I, I, all, all of that, you know, I, but I can, so I was just gonna say, I, I kind of understand from a point of view of, you know, even in my own self, one of the, the practices that I've been adopting probably over the last year or two is not allowing my external world to affect my internal um, and trying to limit that because again, I can be very, or I could be very reactionary at times. Um, and again, even doing interviews like this, you know, normally would, you know, make me all jittery nervous and you worry yourself sick. And then I just got to the point, I was like, this is not, you know, we, we need to deal with some of these things that are going on. So I've been working on that a lot. And again, you know, having that disconnect, I found it to be, you know, actually a really positive thing, um, you know, to, I suppose, to be able to, to deal with some of these things and not get all nervous about it. 
But Jason, I want to ask you as well, when was the first signs for you that you started to feel more like a, you, you were developing a creative mind? Was it in the military? Was it before the military? Uh, was it like you say, you know, if you could pinpoint certain things, uh, when was it at that point that you said, there's something more creative that's going on in my mind here? I don't, I don't know. I think it's always been there, mm -hmm. you know. Do you, your son or daughter, struggle with direction, clarity and purpose? Maybe you struggle with anxiety. Maybe you struggle with self-esteem or confidence issues. Maybe you've got great ideas, but you've no idea how to get from where you are to where you want to be. Don't worry, you're not alone. People around the world struggle with these issues. Hi there, I'm John Morris. I'm the coach of the creative mind and I'm also a psychologist in training. For the last two decades, I've worked with people from all walks of life and all over the world, all with a wide variety of issues. I've worked with people from youth groups to adult education to people dealing with day-to-day -day living issues. And each one of them has an amazing story to tell and we've helped them get clear as to where they are and clear as to where they want to be. And I want to help you too. Like a lot of life coaches and therapists that like to drag things on and leave you dangling on the carrot, I want to make sure that each and every single time that we meet and have a life coaching session together, that you never ever leave saying, man, that was a waste of time, or I didn't get the value that I desired. I am committed to making sure that each and every single time we meet, you are one step closer by the time we finish to a goal that you have in mind. So why should you work with me? Well, let me tell you, as I said, I'm committed to making sure that I provide value, that I provide something that's step-by-step -step and easy to follow. I'm also a fantastic listener. I've been blessed with the gift of listening, and I love to listen to people, their stories, their, their dreams, their desires, because there's nothing more energetic and passionate to me than when a client gets their first desire, or they get that goal, or they hit that big target, or whatever it might be, and also, as the trifecta, I'm committed to you, to helping you take action. So whether or not it be deciding on the university you want to go to, deciding on the course that you want to be at, helping you get excited and passionate about your work environment, whatever it might be, I am committed to helping that happen. I'm also committed, if you need to shed some pounds, if you need to gain some muscle mass, if you need to, I don't know, develop your self-esteem, I'm committed to helping you take action and following a step-by-step -step plan of action that we can put together. But now, folks, I want to tell you about the Early Bird Special Offer that we are launching right now. It is for 10 people and 10 people alone. That's right, if you are interested in having life coaching sessions with me one-on-one, -on -one, 10 people have the opportunity to do that and we're looking to help these people change their lives completely. We take ages 14 and upwards, so if you're interested in learning how to get from where you are to where you want to be, to do really develop that passion, to live a life that you enjoy as opposed to a life that you wake up and think, ah, oh, you know, how to develop and change your mindset from maybe a negative one to a positive one, understanding what fuels your mindset and understanding what creates the kind of life that you want to live, then get in touch with me today. I would love to hear from you. As I say, this is open only for 10 people and once it's done, it's done. So click that box below, get in touch, let's have a conversation backwards and forwards and see if we're a fit for each other and I look forward to working with you. Have an amazing day folks, take care, God bless and I will see you soon. As a, as a kid I would draw and have even draw these scenes. I actually have some of my old sketchbooks um, but I I don't think there's a single point where I found out because I'm I'm really disconnected from my yeah. creativity, if that yeah. makes sense. I approach this whole art thing in, in totally with a business mindset, mm -hmm. yeah. even when it comes to how, how and what I'm going to make. Mm -hmm. So, so yeah, I don't know. I can't really can't really tell you that. I've always had these really wild like stories that generate in my yeah. head. Um, I guess fantasies, you know, imaginations. Uh, it's just always, always kind of been there. I think the creative side of me is stoked by the, um, is stoked by the competitive side of me. Yeah. Where in Hawaii, for instance, where I really picked up photography as a potential career, um, part of, oh, excuse me, let me turn this off. Part of what I part of the reason I tried so hard to be good at the photography was because I just wanted to be better than all the people who were sitting there next to me <laughs> taking photos. Mm -hmm. um, 
and so I started looking for new new angles, new ideas, new new ways to capture stuff, and that's where the creativity came from. Um, and now now I have this really narrow envelope in which I want to make. Yeah. So that's also it's just a competitive creativity that I have. Um, and that's a really awesome thing. I mean, you know, again, you know, for the um, business training that we look at, you know, again, you've answered some of those things. You've got to find out your why. You've got to be, you know, again, willing to put yourself in that niche where you are so laser focused on what you're doing that to a degree, you're the one that excels in it. And I know I spread myself way too thin, you know, from time to time, um, quite a lot of the time, to be fair. But um it's because I just enjoy so many different things and so much variety that's there. When did you start to notice then? And again, it's a really interesting thing because you have a very business mind for artwork. When did that start, you know, approaching itself and start approving itself? Um, we started saying, well, you know, if, if I'm going to do this, I, I recognize because, because again, one of the things that I teach, you know, is your, your paintings are products, you know, your prints are products, mm -hmm. your, you know, mugs and cups and all your merchandise, they're all products. And you are essentially the salesperson. And it's helping artists to kind of adopt that mentality of, hey, I'm in business here, and getting that really clear in mind. When did that start to develop for you? Did that develop before the art did? Because, <laughs> uh, uh, so I got my, my bachelor's is in managerial economics. Mm -hmm. And uh, at the same time, I was attending a lot of entrepreneur startup events, like conferences and, and venture capital things, and just sitting okay. there and watching. Um, my, my first venture, it wasn't art. It was this thing I wanted to make in the stock market. But uh, when, I, when I finished my bachelor's and couldn't get a job, I started looking toward the only thing that was making me money, mm -hmm. which was my occasional art sale. And I just needed a way to sell the art that would make me enough money. And I uh, just adopted the idea and the business plan of luxury watches is sort of my go-to. Mm -hmm. Like, what would I do if I made a five thousand dollar watch? And how would I, yeah. how would I sell it? And that's that's how I've started promoting my work. And you know, I, in the beginning, it was not five thousand dollars. It was like a thousand. Yeah, I, I remember I went to a. I was just on Clubhouse yesterday talking about this. Uh, I was at a, a Christmas art show in, on Oahu and selling pieces for a few hundred dollars. Mm -hmm. And I just, I was like, you know what? You know, if I can sell, basically I know that I'm gonna sell five or six pieces. And I know that the people who can buy them are gonna spend, you know, a few hundred dollars on, yeah. on each piece. And the people who can't buy them wouldn't even spend mm -hmm. $10 on it, right? So the people who can buy them would also spend a thousand or two thousand dollars on a piece. So I just took my biggest piece and I was like, okay, you're sixteen hundred bucks, mm -hmm. and see if I can sell it, and it sold. So I realized that price is marketing and attracting your people and and attracting the right audience, and yeah. um, and then it just became sort of a a trend of of how who's my audience and how much do they want to pay mm -hmm. for it. So. I forgot what your question was, but that's kind of how I suppose <laughs> It was when the, the business mindset started to, you know, to, to uh, reveal itself. But I, I, I love that because, you know, the, I, and, you know, I, I'd probably um, shame myself here, but my first painting that I did that sold, I think I sold it for like $15. You know, we're, we're talking, gosh, 20 years ago. Um, because again, it was having... I was raised, you know, like you, it was, it was the whole thing of, you know, you, you do art as a hobby. You don't do it as a, as a full-time living. Um, and, you know, very few people make, you know, any money doing artwork. Well, obviously now with the invention of social media and whatnot, we, we know that is nonsense. And, you know, we, we know that it is possible. People's minds just need to be opened up a lot and they need to go through that business training of, okay, how do I market myself? How do I speak to customers? How do I put myself out there to build relationships? How do I deal with difficult customers? Because I, I bet wow. you've probably got stories, uh, the, the length and breadth here and everywhere of, of folks that have been difficult from time to time. Um, I know mm -hmm. I certainly have, and uh, it's, uh, it's part of the business. Um, but I want to ask you, where, you know, how did you get them from, from where you were in terms of having this ideal in, in, the, in the nucleus to 
going forward and saying, right, this is something I'm going to do. Was it literally just a case for you of saying, bang, because you, you seem like the kind of person with that mindset of I'm doing this and now I'm taking the action. And then one leads to another, leads to another, to another. Um, or was there a, a period in time where it was like, mm, I'll give it some thought and see what opens up. Well, the dream used to be, I would be a day trader on the stock market and then okay. travel and take pictures wherever. And then uh, I sort of failed. And um, you produced results. <laughs> yeah, I produced, yeah, terrible results. And, um, and then I went uh, to college. This is after I got out of the military. Uh, I finished my bachelor's. It, it just kind of progressed as I just realized I, I'm not a hireable person. Yeah. And I think it's like something attached to my name or maybe it's my face. Because even when I was a kid, I couldn't get a job. Right. Like I applied to McDonald's and they said, no, but you know, they just, uh, I've never really been able to land work. And I have a master's degree in organizational leadership mm -hmm. and a project management cer certification, you know, and I was in the military for six years, managing millions of dollars of explosives. Um, <laughs> so I have a good resume. It just, people won't fucking hire me. And, um, I don't, I don't honestly don't know what it is. I've had professionals look at my resume and, and do my resume for me. And I've taken everything off my resume and applied for dishwasher jobs and <laughs> couldn't get anything. Uh, so I've always been working on the second source of income yeah. because I had to. Mm -hmm. um, and then in 2014, I suppose it started becoming, in 2014, I finished my, my bachelor's and I did this, like I finished my master's, I mean, and then I did this trip around the world. I had set up meetings in Dubai and Italy and the Philippines um, to try to sell my work. Wow. And, and I actually got a big sale in Dubai, which turned into a debacle, but, um, oh. and, and it became real, you know, it became like yeah. a more, you know, once I really could, was committed to it, then it became uh, the success started coming. The successes started coming and then you just expound or you you do what works more yeah so i don't know if that's an answer to your question i didn't like have a click in my head and said oh this is what i want to do yeah you know i still question whether this is what i want to do um because it is hard you know like yeah. sometimes yeah. you have you have big months like i had a i keep a board my vision board right here i had a twenty two thousand dollar january Wow. And I'm sitting here, that all happened in the beginning of January, uh -huh. right? So January 15 probably was the end of that like rush of income. Mm -hmm. And then um, now it's February 4, or maybe 5 for you. No, no, still the 4th, still the 4th. <laughs> still the 4th. So I technically haven't had a sale in like 20 some days, Yeah, you know? And it, I'm so focused on the business side where if I don't get that sale, I start to feel really... Yeah shaky you know it's really i start to lose confidence in, in everything in, in the process but you have to let the process take place you have to let the yeah. relationships develop and i think at this point i can be pretty confident that the next sale is coming mm -hmm. it's just you know i just have to focus on making more opportunities yeah um but yeah, yeah. it gets hard and, and these like 25 days of of no art sales even though i have other income mm -hmm. these of no art sales which is the the core of my business is uh make me question the whole the whole thing you know it, it's interesting obviously talking from a from an artist point of view and i think that's you know, probably the best way to, to lead the conversation um because i know it in myself i'm exactly the same as you from that point of view um you know we've been doing a lot of building stuff since december last year when i unexpectedly had to build five websites for the various parts of our business and you know it, it was like okay i know i'm going into a building phase here now my wife's got income that's great we've got income coming in there but again i know that during this time it's going to be slow because that's where my focus is um you know and it's it is that difficult thing because you i mean i i, I would look at what you're doing right now and i would say from my perspective you're doing exactly what you're going to be doing um you know like you said when, when i saw the the tree on fire the, the other day 
I was like, wow, you know, again, seeing these photographs, seeing these things, the fact that you're making such a phenomenal living doing what you love. But again, yes, it's expensive with framing, with canvas, with all the other things, um, you know, and again, you know, what we talk about with business plans is make sure you've got some low ticket stuff. I'm sure you probably already got this anyway, but low ticket stuff that's there. So the cheaper options and then building things up as well to your high ticket. I actually ticket. don't do that. So again, I don't do that. I don't have any low ticket stuff. Right. <laughs> The, the lowest price point that I started is like two grand wow. um, US. And uh, that's a, I, I feel like that business plan is viable mm -hmm. and from a product standpoint works. Yep. However, from it depends on the direction you want to go with yeah. your career. Yeah. Obviously, I mean, you're, you're essentially like the Rolex of your industry. You know, Rolex doesn't make something that's $50. Rolex makes something that's $1,000 plus, you know, mm -hmm. from, from looking at that point of view. And you've obviously got that clear vision as to where you're, you're going with that. And that's fantastic. It, it really, really is. Yeah. I remember at that same art fair where I was selling the larger pieces, I had some guy come up to me and he was like, basically where is all your low ticket stuff how are you going to sell to all these people who can't afford your work mm -hmm. and i was super stubborn about <laughs> that's i don't want to you know but at the same time that guy had pulled in like three grand by the time we had that conversation on the second day yeah and i didn't make any i didn't really make any big money until the last day uh -huh. of the art show so it's totally totally valid it's just who is your audience yeah and one of the things that i started doing but i didn't run it last year is uh, I do offer a, lo a low ticket, low price point item, mm -hmm. but I only offer it once a year. Right. So I'll do like, I do this thing called a poster giveaway where I'll give away four posters, but I'll sell 10 grand worth yeah. of posters through the promotion. Um, but it's all like $200 pieces to all the people who, you know, it's just honoring your fans because not everyone is in your target market, um, which, you know, looking at it now from a different perspective, it's a bad thing. I created an audience of people who can't afford my work. Um, and uh, and that's, that's bad. But since they're there, you know, give them something and, and make a lot of money yeah. Um, yeah. in the process. That's interesting. You know, certainly uh, things that were coming to my mind there as you were talking, how do you cope with you know, like you're saying, because again, for those that don't know, you know, any creative business usually is not, you know, just plain sailing. It's usually, as, as um, Jason was saying, you know, where you've got one big sale, then nothing, another sale, nothing, you know, and so on, so on, so on, so on. Um, you know, some months you can go ahead and tell, you know, some weeks you can go ahead and sell 10 grand's worth of commission paintings and things. And that's great, but then you may end up with nothing for another three or four months. How do you cope with that pressure that's there? You have to, you have to learn how to manage cash flow. Yes, <laughs> yes. Yeah, because I can make, you know, last year, my biggest month was like 30 something grand. Okay. Um, I don't pay myself 30 grand. Mm -hmm. Let's say after cost and everything I spent to make all that work, maybe let's say it's 18 or 19,000. Okay. Right. Um, that goes into a business account. And then I pay myself three grand because that's what I, that's what I need a month yeah. to survive. So that 18 grand is now six months of income. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then that's, that's the float. Unless of course you want to buy a medium format camera and then that 18 grand is nothing and it's gone. But yes. um <laughs> but you have to manage your cash flow. And yeah. uh I don't know when this podcast is gonna come out, but uh in the next sometime this month, I'm actually gonna do a webinar with my financial planners. Okay. And we're gonna talk about all of that stuff, I think. Um, you know, they're they're mostly gonna be centered around the ideas of, you know, planning for retirement for artists yeah. and for for small businesses, it's basically what you are. You're just a small business who yeah. sells art. Um, but I'm going to push them to talk about and and give their opinions on cash flow and mm -hmm. and budgeting and things like that. Because I think it is something that's really important. I know I was doing a teaching a couple of weeks ago on the show called Going Deeper. Um, you know, we're looking all about how to manage your money, and you've got your five different sections and. 
um, you know, making sure that you've got your bills covered, making sure that you've got your emergency fund covered, your pension and all that kind of stuff. Um, and then the last one is really your, you, you kind of fund money, you know, all that, all that kind of stuff and what you're looking at doing. But it's so important for people to be aware and to actually take ownership of their own cash flow, because otherwise they end up at the end of the month where they're like, or, or even in the middle of the month where like, I've got no money left. What do I do? Um, you know, and obviously it's, it's going forward. Just now, I wonder that's just not good for your creativity either. You know, that exactly. pressure really holds you back and, yeah. and makes you make decisions out of desperation. Yes. And then your your buyers can see it. Your buyers can uh, can sense it, and yeah. that that's a super turn off to to sales. It is, and then when, when buyers can look and say, you know, your your painting looks like you were really stressed. Now, if you're trying to sell a painting that looks really stressed, great. You know, stress works for you. Uh, you know, if if you choose to focus on those thinking uh, on those feelings, um, but when you're used to more peaceful and relaxed and calm kind of art, artwork, then it can sometimes even shock your you know your your audience into a case of, um, okay, what's actually going on here? Is, there, is everything okay and, and, and all that kind of stuff? Jason, I want to ask you as well, what was school like? School life like for you? Is it something you enjoyed or was it something that you were like, I'm going here because I have to, but you know, I can't wait to get out into the big wide world? What do you mean, like high school yeah. or college? High school? I mean, it was something I went through. It's something I endured. Yeah. You know, I, like I said, I wasn't good with people. I wasn't good with, uh, I walked around and I looked like a ticking time bomb all the right. time. Uh, I was just really, really angry. So I didn't have any friends. Like my, my, all my interpersonal uh, connections yeah. were either, you know, based on academia or based on sports. Cause I was lucky that I was really good. I'm a, a good athlete. Mm -hmm. um, so that's where I was able to to make connections. But outside of, you know, scholarly activities, I didn't have any connections or friends or whatnot. So high school sucked. High school sucked for me. Yeah. Was there a period in your life that that started to change, that you started to develop more friendships, late, obviously later on in life? Um, or I still don't have a lot of friends, <laughs> to tell you the truth. Uh, just that because I developed into a loner. Yeah. Um, yeah, you know, I, I consider um, if I loosen up my my definition of what a friend is, you know, and expand that to people I talk to regularly on the internet, then yeah, I have I have some friends, and we have a really cool tribe of a, a thing we call a tribe uh, of photographers, and we meet at like the big expos in in the country, so we see each other twice a year, um, but. I'm probably still inclined to looking like I'm angry, like that, that rest and bitch face. Um, <laughs> but I'm better at it. Yeah. And I'm, I'm really good in social situations that are focused on a, on a, on a goal. Okay. And um, otherwise, I'm just a wallflower. Yeah. Yeah. I, I hear you with that. Um, again, you know, <laughs> basically put it put us in the room and i think if we were to share you know stories um i think we probably think very similarly because you know i i struggle and i am for, for years i was just like i want to be around people i want to know how to, to interact but for whatever reason you know i just never found that that particular thing and like you i end up jumping into my work and literally working you know every, every hour that there is um, and enjoying it and loving it, but doing that more out of, you know, oh, well, you know, I'm not, I'm not that fussed about meeting up with a whole host of people outside. Again, like you, I like stuff when there's a goal. If I'm if I'm there just for a meetup situation, I'm kind of like, okay, we're here, we've seen each other, we've talked backwards and forwards, and now what do we do? Oh, it's getting to the nonsense conversations now. Let let's you know, <laughs> let's can we go home kind of thing and, and whatnot. Mm -hmm. So, I, I'm really bad at goodbyes. So that again. So I'm really bad at goodbye. Oh, right. You know, like when, when cell phones started just being used more frequently, I would, I'd never say goodbye. You know, it's like, as you were talking and whatever, it's like, okay, I'll meet you there at 10. And then I would just hang up. All right. You know, <laughs> until someone complained about it because everyone says, okay, I meet you at 10. Okay, bye. All right, bye. You know, and that seems so useless. And even in my course, every, every Wednesday or currently is every Wednesday, but we have a once a week coaching call that I call roundtables. Mm -hmm. And at the end of the coaching call, I'm just like, okay, and I hang up. 
<laughs> I'd close everyone else. Like everyone else, I'm really bad at goodbye. I don't, I don't want to be like, bye you, bye you, you know, thanks for showing up, blah, blah, blah. I'm just like, okay, we're done. Or I'm done. And I hang up. So maybe that's, that's something. That's I, I, I've got to ask you as well, just, just while I'm thinking about it, how do you respond when people compliment your work? Because that's a question I get asked all the time. And I, I, nowadays I'm just like, thank you very much. I appreciate that. Or, or whatever it is. But after like 15 times, you're like, okay, now I'm starting to feel awkward. Now I'm starting to feel anxious, you know, <laughs> just <laughs> thanks for it. How do you respond when people, um, you know, praise your artwork? I usually just with a simple thank you. Yeah. Um, in person, I probably like smile or maybe actually say thank you or, or you know, just acknowledge what they said. Mm -hmm. But if they keep saying it over and over, which happens, you know, at art fairs and it, it's a stalling situation. If you're thinking about them as a as a social psychological behavior, yeah. they have another idea they want to sh push out of their head. They just can't articulate it yet. Uh -huh. So they're still stuck on, oh, I'm amazed or I'm in love or, or what have you. So then I will just turn the conversation. And, um, you know, they're like, I love it. I love it, blah, blah, blah. And you're like, okay, thanks. Um, yeah, I really appreciate that. Uh, so, you know, is there a space that you think this would fit in? Yeah. You know, or, or what do you think about this color in particular? Well, what is your favorite color mm -hmm. or what is it about this piece that you love like specifically um you just change you direct the conversation yeah that's what you have to you yeah. have to do and i think that's a fantastic way and it's a fantastic thing to to obviously do i've got to ask you as well that there's there's two things i've got to ask about this the, the first one what led you to write the book random thoughts it's uh naked thoughts naked um, thoughts sorry naked thoughts let me let me grab it so I can because the cover will help. Yeah, I didn't know we were going to talk about that. And today. and and while you're doing that, actually, Jason, we've got to let folks know that if you would like to order Jason's book, Naked Thoughts, not Random Thoughts, Naked Thoughts, um, you can do. We'll put the Amazon link in the uh, caption bar so you can check it out there. Um, it's a very very interesting read, uh, and it's just a lot of observations and examinations from Jason's mind as well. Ah, yeah. So this is Naked Thoughts. Self plug. You got to figure out where on my camera the, <laughs> there you go. <laughs> the focus is. Um, what? I live in my head a lot. Yeah. You know? And then one day, uh, I was having a really rough time getting home from, from Dubai after they didn't pay me for my sale. Um, oh, wow. And I spent all the money that I thought I was going to make. And then, oh, no. Yeah. Uh, there's a cash flow lesson in there. But... Um, yes. I was sitting in an airport in Stockholm, which is the first naked thought in here. And I just wrote down what I was thinking and I shared it on Facebook. And like, I, I have a weird audience <laughs> on my personal and public profiles where I feel like people don't really like my work. <laughs> I don't, I don't know why they follow me, but they don't really like it. Um, it's a pain in the ass and frustrating, but. Uh, when I shared this writing, like people were super into it. It was like wow. it was something they've never read before. It was a direct window into how I think, which isn't shared very often. Yeah. Everyone censors themselves, um, and that gave me a little more courage to write the next one, mm -hmm. which was I don't even remember, uh, which was just on in New York City after I had made it home, sitting on the rooftop, and and so on and so forth, you know. I, I think um, chapter two sticks out in my mind the most, if I've got this correct, because I, th I think the, the the expression that comes through with that, um, I'm interested to know what book was it that you were reading in chapter two that you literally were just like, oh my goodness, no, I, you know, all, all, you know, writing is, uh, you know, there was just this big expression of frustration, I think, with this book, whatever it was that you were reading. And I thought to myself, I was like, I have got to, I've got to find out what this book is. I'm sure it was chapter two. Um, I don't yeah. think it was chapter two. I'm not, I don't remember it. So this is a six year project. Okay. So the first one happened in 2014. The last one in the book is uh, 2018, maybe. Okay. So I'm not sure, I'm not sure which, uh, <laughs> which one you're talking about. Um, whiskey and tea. Was I think it was one you were sitting in a cafe or something and, and some lady had walked in and um I, I just remember like i said it caught my attention for a variety of different reasons um but i was just like oh let's uh just see if i can pull it up um sorry we'll, we'll edit this out uh, <laughs>
Because they're only small chapters, so it, it was, you know, again, very, very easy to... I don't actually know where it, I don't know where it was now. I've... Yeah, these, these are all super consumable. Yeah. Long of the time reads. Um, yeah, I'm not sure, because I, I know that I've mentioned several books in this book. Um, like there, there, I just mentioned the book Accidental Time Machine. Yeah, there um, we go. Uh, rooftop, uh, Naked Thoughts, hashtag two. I'm sitting on a rooftop in NYC. The view is Manhattan from the Roosevelt Island. Uh, I just threw my Kindle uh, to the table and discussed how some people publish books is beyond me. Um, I was it... reading a book on selling art. Oh, right. <laughs> yeah, it was fucking terrible. It's it's on my library over there. I don't I don't want to call out the guy publicly, but um, the the sentence structure and the language is stupid. He took him forever to complete a thought, um, and he repeated himself so many goddamn times with, without providing any real value. Right. Uh, I don't. Because that made, that really did make me laugh. And then all of a sudden, the next paragraph is like, and this lady's just walked in or, or whatever it was. <laughs> it's just like just from one thing to another. It was brilliant. Mm, thanks. Um, yeah, it always surprises me that people really enjoy this. And it's got like 30 like good reviews so far. Uh -huh. It's not it's not selling off the charts off, you know, at, by any means, but yeah. it surprises me, you know, those reviews when what people say. Um, yeah, a lot of the books you read on selling work are either instantly outdated or significantly yeah. outdated. And a lot of them are just like they they pay lip service to themselves. Mm -hmm. um, See, one of the things I found actually, and it's interesting you brought that up. Uh, and again, this this isn't in my notes or anything, folks. So we're just ad libbing kind of as we go along here, which is sometimes where the gold nuggets are found. Um, I read, I, I don't know how many books last year, and again, all about the same topic. Because again, I, I was looking because trying to get to that that next level and do whatever you're going to do. Um, and oddly enough, I was looking without when I should have been looking within. Once I started looking within, I found the answers to what I was looking for. Um, but there was so many people that would say, right, if you do this, this and this. And I'm thinking, I've been doing that exact same thing now for 15 years, you know, and uh we're still pretty much where we were before you know and and again it's finding like you say it's finding those gold nuggets but you find there's a lot of them that will say the same thing and what interested me about your course your book your approach to doing things again it was you know an artist from a business perspective not a you know not an artist from an artist perspective trying to sell like the amount of times that i've spoken with artists that are trying to sell artwork on the art sites um and i'm thinking if you're an artist would you buy other people's artwork and they're like no i was like right so why are you trying to sell artwork to other artists um and and like, oh right okay so now we start thinking about different things and, and going along but um yeah, it, 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 like I say, I, I thoroughly loved it because, again, it was an insight to you. It was an insight into your mind as well, um, which I thoroughly loved. And, and again, that there's the amazing mind that's there. I, I've got to ask, you know, what was some of the, the obviously, aside from what we talked about um, earlier on, what have been some of the greatest battles that you have come through and that you're now on the other side of that you can say, wow, I learned something from that? Uh, aside from this thing we, in Dubai, which I'm in, I'm intrigued by. <laughs> uh, I don't know. That that seems like a really grandiose mm -hmm. question. I don't I don't have like grandiose battles. Uh, on my vision board right here, I keep a. That's my project management, and then on nice. my vision board, there's, you can see like a little picture on the top yep. corner, and that's like my TEDx ribbon, and then there's that picture. Um, that's a picture that I, a self portrait that I took mm -hmm. after I was lost in the White Mountains for three days in Alaska. Wow. And um, that was probably the hardest thing I've ever done in my life was not die <laughs> in the mountains. Um, <laughs> and I had gone off trail and I didn't know I was off trail. Right. And then when I figured out that I was off trail, I thought I could navigate my way as a shortcut back. And that ended up just getting me more lost. Wow. But um da, da, da. so one of the things one of the things I learned. Was... Sorry, go. Cool. Uh I can't remember. I learned it in a in a session that I, I actually paid for or did with a psychologist. Um 
she she had me visualize like a superhero moment yeah or some sort and had me use that visualization as a tool to correct my posture okay where posture is like the way i'm approaching any type of situation so this is my my one thing i think about and you know when i think about it i can sit up a little bit straighter and, and be a little bit more of my own kind of hero and, and figure out and fight my way through whatever's going on. And that is a, as a tool for self-management has been really helpful. That was good. Um, so that experience, I suppose, is something that continues or I carry with me um, for, for some time. Mm -hmm. For, that was like in 2006. Wow, what was going through your head when you're you're up in the mountains and all of a sudden it's like um, I'm I'm kind of lost here and then that that fight for survival because that's a really big thing. The only thing I can liken it to was being stuck on a golf course. Uh, there was a blizzard coming in and I'm thinking if I fall because everything was just covered in snow and I'm like if I fall here and break my ankle, I'm going to get covered in snow. I'm probably going to freeze to death and I'm probably dead. Um, not quite the same thing. <laughs> that's the best that I can kind of bring it bring it mm -hmm. together. What but what was going through your what was your mindset while you were going through that experience? Um it was very basic, mm -hmm. very simple thoughts. You know, I was terrified, I was enraged, or I was like pathetic and whining. Uh, <laughs> you know, one at a time. Not at the yeah, same time. Yeah. So I would go through like periods of just where I was just so pissed that I could be in a situation. Mm -hmm. or And then I'd go through periods where I felt like I didn't know what to do. And it was just kind of a hopelessness feeling. Um, I would have like manic attacks okay. while I was out there. And, and, and it would just get me more lost or more hurt or more frustrated. Um, and those were just sprinkled into the times where I was just completely just doing what I felt like I needed to do to survive, you know, that detached piece. Yes. So maybe, you know, I never really thought of this, but maybe that, um, that uh, detachment mm -hmm. facade that I have is, uh, had broke a little during that time. Okay. Um, but I knew, I've, I realized that I, I was traveling in a, in a valley or more like a, a gorge. Mm -hmm. And I knew that I needed to find a landmark. So I eventually directed all of my energy to climbing mountainsides out of the, out of the gorge, look for a landmark, and then go back down to the water and keep walking until mm -hmm. I would do it again. Um, and eventually I saw a landmark and, and managed to navigate to it. Wow. And that, that's an amazing thing. Like you say, out there for three days, you know, a lot of people would say, oh, you know, well, it's, it's a great time to think, but it's like, I'm, I'm thinking about surviving. I'm thinking about my next step. I'm thinking about that next. Yeah, it wasn't, it wasn't, I didn't go camping, for yeah. three days, you know, and it was <laughs> off, off Wi-Fi. I was, uh, I had brought one can of soup and a jacket and that was it for a 15 mile hike. And uh, yeah. Wow. And it, it's, you know, I mean, that, that's just an amazing thing in itself to, to you know, obviously to, to think about that. Um, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just amazing. And, and, and I've got to ask as well, talk us through the situation that happened in Dubai. Because again, we start at the topic now, you know, we, we, I, need to, I need, need to know the end of the story as, as to what happened. Uh, well, poor planning and non-cultural awareness. Okay. I ended up in the Middle East during Ramadan. Right. So basically life shuts down over there for that time. But I still managed to, to meet my guy and, and sh I had brought like a portfolio I was traveling with of just rolled up artwork and we just had this great uh, meeting in his like penthouse, whatever office with this big sweeping view and, and he was laughing and he was happy and, and all these stories were being exchanged and so on. And then um, he was like, okay, well, I want this piece and we'll just uh, coordinate with my assistant to buy it. But the whole coordination part just didn't, was not smooth. And right. it wasn't a language barrier. It was just, they didn't really mean to buy it. Or maybe she just didn't feel like working because it was Ramadan. Okay. And then um, and and then by the time it had, uh, 
by, by the time time had elapsed, they just decided they didn't want it anymore. So the sale was, it was a, it was a big for me. It was like 5,000 ish and um, a big for me at the time. And uh, I was like, okay, well now that I have all this extra money, I'm going to extend my trip. Oh. So I went to Italy and then from Italy, I met a girl. So then I went to Spain with her and then we went to Morocco and then back to, back to Spain and back to Italy and spending all this money and and then the check never came oh wow so yeah that was that was that was rough yeah lesson. and i've probably made that mistake three or four times since then you know spend <laughs> expecting a payment and then not getting it yeah people bailing on a sale or whatnot i have a piece in the wall these this piece that you can't see over there and the piece behind me was supposed to be sold right and i think because of covid i think i think she she was older, so I, I don't know. Like I'm assuming she died because we were having great conversations. Yeah. Um, she was very responsive in like the whole relationship building thing, and then she just went silent, wow. just gone. I was actually I, I need to. We were texting, but I need to um, send her an email. Just one final follow up. Um, it, it is one of the things I think just just as, we, as we're wrapping up um, and coming towards the end of our time together to, to remember folks that are you know in in the creative you know world and things. Because, you know, Jason's story there isn't, you know, unique to him. You know, I've gone through the same thing. Several artists that I know and have coached have gone through the same thing where you get so excited and you think, oh, there's a sale that's going to go through. It's going to go through. It's amazing. I've got money coming in. And then all of a sudden it falls silent. Or, you know, if they're paying it on a payment plan and they're scheduled to pay it on the third and then you've got to chase them for it and you've got to do this. This is not an easy business. Yeah. I mean, this is not an easy business that we are in. It's a commitment. It's a lifestyle choice. Um, for both Jason and I, you know, we do, we did this and we started this out of necessity and yes, opportunity often comes from necessity or setbacks, but it wasn't something that we sat there and thought, uh, okay, I know, let, let's, let's do this. It was a case of, okay, we, we need money coming in and, uh, you know, it, it's, I think going to be the same, you know, for, for every creative mind that's out there, that's doing this, that's trying to make a living with their artwork, um, it isn't easy. It's a lifestyle choice. But as, as Jason said, you know, he struggled. And this is a guy that's far smarter than I am on paper and struggles getting a job, you know, and that's what led me to really believe that Jason's doing exactly what he's meant to be doing at this point. And it, I mean, it is so exciting. Jason, I've just got, I think maybe two questions to, to ask you. The first- I don't have a time limit. So a lot of times whenever I do podcasts, they all run long. So if if you want to keep going, we can keep going. Okay. Um, so I literally just two questions to ask you. Um, Cause again, I don't want to take up too much of your time. I'm very, very time conscious and, uh, and aware of that. But what are you passionate about going forward? I, I guess the same stuff I'm doing right now. I, ha I have this- this project that I'm calling personifications of nature, which is an extension, kind of what I mentioned before, like the intersection of my aria and my landscapes, but also the intersection of this small body of work that I have where nature has sort of personified itself. Okay. Um, I have this picture of a, of a rock in Hawaii that uh, the locals attribute as their guardian um, against the ocean. And it has a very distinct face in it. But the more you look at that rock, there's like, I've been told there's as many as 14 faces wow. in that scene. Um, and I have another piece where there's a dragon, like an enormous dragon. It's, the piece is called Kele Kona Keha. And um, the dragon is rising. The, all of the clouds are moving toward you in this plane, mm -hmm. right? And then the dragon is rising on a different plane. And you, when you see it, it's this enormous column with the head of a dragon, you know? Uh -huh. um, and then I have another piece that I shot in Hawaii or shot here in Seattle where there's a the shape of a woman underneath water that's flowing and you know so they have these personification the things that I call personification of nature that's and they I have a, a half dozen or more and I wanted to start instead of just discovering them in my images I wanted to start creating them in on purpose mm -hmm. so I have this intersection of all three of these so I, I'm going to bring a model in I'm going to shoot a landscape I'm going to make the model look like a piece of nature, um, like to the millionth degree. Like one of them, I have a prosthetic artist who's going to create a skin of rock. Wow. That's going to go on her so that she looks like, if she were to walk down the street, yeah. she would look like the thing, you know, or, or 
that guy from the Marvel movie, the blue one, I can't remember his name. Um, so I know he so that's beast. a project that I really want to get started on. Um, I'm also trying to move away from photography. Like I don't want to be considered a landscape photographer anymore uh -huh. because that puts me into a, a hole. Yeah. Well, not a hole, but a... Uh, it limits you creatively. No, not limits no. me. It limits the idea that the okay. buyer has of who I am. Yeah. And what I do. And, you know, I like it to some degree when people say this looks like a painting. Mm -hmm. I also don't like it because it, it, it means that they don't consider photography art, but, uh, but they think it's a painting. So fine. Um, but I want the work to not be questionable. Yeah. I remember in Art Basel in Florida, um, in Miami, I had one guy who liked all of the areas. I had this big 20 or 40, 40 foot display, 20 foot booth, so 10, 20, 10, and uh, these big six foot areas. And he was really into them until he found out that they were photographs. Wow. Um, and this, this guy, this guy was like, his watch was worth more than my life. Like he, wow. he had money, you know? So this, that could have been a big sale, but yeah. there, there's a stigma around the value of photography yeah. as art. And I just don't want that question mark in my work anymore. So, so I remove language from, mm -hmm from the way I describe myself. You know, I don't ever say the word picture. Yeah. I never say the word print. Um, I avoid calling myself a photographer. I just say I'm an artist. And, um, you know, to try to limit the perception of how people are receiving the work. And uh, uh, so that was, a, that was a walking answer. But yeah, um, that's the project I'm looking forward to. I'm also writing another book called Dream Daggers and Imaginary Friends. Nice. And um, it's going to be another collection of short stories, but this short stories are made out, or fictional, made out of my dreams. Um, so that's coming. I'm hoping that's it'll come out this year. So I, I have some projects to work on. And that's know? good and that's exciting. But it, it is one of the things, actually, and I'm glad you touched on it. You know, there is a stigma around the creative mindset. I was doing an interview with Iris Scott, um, the finger painting artist. Um, based out yeah. in Mexico. Now she just moved. Um, she does the animals, right? Yes, yes, that's the one. Yeah. Um, very interesting lady, uh, to, to say the least. But, you know, it was one of the things that we discussed. It, it was, you know, when people approach you, you know, to do custom work or anything like that, or, you know, writing or music or whatever it might be, you know, I always find a little bit that they're just like okay you're an artist and we've got to pay for this work and oh you're charging that amount for it really as if you know what we do is you know not worth it and there was a big campaign that went out I think last year I don't know if you were aware of it um I think it was a global thing where you know it, it was the whole thing of well artists you know need to basically get a you know a proper job and I just spoke out very openly on, on social media and, you know, to 25,000 people. And I just said, look, without artists and without people such as myself, you know, you can say goodbye to TV. You can say goodbye to your films. You can say goodbye to your music. You can say goodbye to your books and everything that's there. Art has a major part to play in the world. And obviously what you're doing is phenomenal, you know, because you're telling stories through your art, you're telling stories through your um, photography and, and through all the other things that you do. Um, and it's a pheno pheno you know, phenomenal thing, just the same as I tell stories through canvas and through paintbrushes, um, you know, and I think it's helping artists now to see, look, you have amazing worth and what you do is something that no one else can do. They can get close to it, but they'll never see the world exactly as you do. Yeah, uh, I, I thought I had a response to that, but I don't. So, uh, I mean, that's all right. Um, it's all correct. Yeah. Good. <laughs> the final question <laughs> I've got for you, Jason, um, and, and I'm just intrigued, and is there a spiritual side to you? That sounds like a strange question. Oh, man. Okay, so, no. But yes, okay. I mean, <laughs> I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't subscribe to any of the established yeah. spiritual or religious dogmas. Mm -hmm. um, if I was to to contemplate a 
God-like figure, um, I, I would say, yeah, I totally believe that they exist as in more than one. Yeah. And I really think it's just a economy of scale where um, just in capability and ability and power and longevity, there's gotta be something out there that lives longer, mm -hmm. is smarter, uh, more capable than us. And it's really just a creation thing. Like we are on the verge of creating AI that would make humanity as a being a godlike force, right? Mm -hmm. Because it's creating life. Uh, so my books, which will open up an hour long can of worms, <laughs> but um, they all have um, religious or spiritual systems in it, okay. which are just adapt adaptations of, of how I how I choose to, to interpret yeah. the stories that I've heard about God or gods. Um, but I don't, I'm not a good meditator. I'm not a good practitioner of any thought series or thought school of thought. Um, so I think the, I think the best answer is no. People always say to me, and then I always say, there's no right or wrong answer to, to that question. Because they always think, oh, well, you're based on, you, you believe this. And I'm like, yeah, but that doesn't mean that, you, you know, you need to do the same thing. Um, but no, and, and that's, you know, that's, that's a good answer. But yeah, you know, from listening to you, from observing you in the last hour and a bit we've spent together, because I, I like to observe people and I sometimes get lost in the conversation and I'm, I'm terrible for that at times. But also from, from your works and things, I would say there's a lot of depth that's there with you. And again, this is just my own observation. And there's a lot of thought that goes into what you do. And equally, there's maybe no thought. And sometimes it's a case of this is what I love. This is where I'm at. And to have that disconnect where you know in yourself that this is just what you love. This is it's the flow of who you are. I think is a kind of wonderful thing. If the, any of that makes sense at all. <laughs> I mean, you know, a picture said tells a thousand words, yeah. blah, blah, blah. But the person telling those words is not the, not the creator of the picture. It's the observer. Yeah. So I hear that a lot. Like people say, God gave me a talent or God created the scene or, um, you know, so on and so forth. But uh, I personally don't subscribe to all of that. And, and I just let it flow yeah. around the conversation, you know. And that's a good thing because I think when you you know you let things flow, they just they, they go on by, they do whatever they go. And don't, and God may have given you that talent, but equally it was you that chose to act upon it. And that's you know what makes I think your stuff really really special and unique. Is there anything we want to you, you want to chat about before we wrap up today's show? No, I didn't. I didn't come with an agenda, so <laughs> um, yeah, I got nothing. And that's okay. Where can folks find you on social media, Jason? Uh, well, there's a lot of places, of course, you know, there's Instagram. I, I'd probably that. be quicker saying where can't folks find you on social media? Um, I, I think uh, what I would do for, for your people, for your, your audience is um, they can just go to jasonmatias.com slash John Morris. Yeah. And yeah. I'll have a, you know, a little page that with links and, and maybe some offers for you guys. Like uh, one thing I like to do for, for people's audiences is, um, you know, just a way to say thank you to you and, and appreciate you introducing me to people is um, they'll just be an offer, you know, if they're interested in the art selling art, then uh, I think the what I'll do, I'm, I'm thinking off the cuff right now because I didn't really plan this out. But um, <laughs> like the first 10 people that mention your name, I'll, I'll do free one on ones, um, hour long one on ones. Or if you're interested in a piece of art, we'll throw like a five or 10 percent discount in there if they mention you. Um, and then there'll just be links to everything we talked about. Like we talked about personifications and and the why I create article and, and the tree of fire that you love. So I'll, I'll toss those on that page too. So people can check out what we talked about. That's really awesome. And and Jason, I've got to say thank you, you know, so much for spending the time and taking the time today to chat with me. Folks, you've got to check out Jason's book, Naked Thoughts, not Random Thoughts, Naked Thoughts. Mm -hmm. um, and make sure to look out for his new book that's going to be coming later on this year. I'm really excited. I can't wait to read that one. But if you want to check out Naked Thoughts, you can. The link is in the chat bar below. And if you'd like to check out my brand new book, The Battles We All Face, which has been sitting behind me for the last hour and a bit, you can do. If you are struggling with anxiety or you're struggling with trauma or you're struggling with just 
just, again, looking for a little bit of guidance, a little bit of comfort, and if nothing else, to know that you are not alone in what you're going through, then this is definitely a book for you. And you can check that out and so much more content on our brand new website, thebattleswealthface.com. Jason, thank you so much for being my special guest today. I really appreciate it. Definitely go and check out Jason's stuff, folks. And we want to thank you so much. This has been the Mind, Body and Soul podcast, where we help you find balance in the craziness of day-to-day life. And I've been your host, John Morris. Until next time, take care, and I'll see you soon. Yeah, see you, see you guys soon. Yeah, I'm terrible at Dubai, so let's just... Uh, you That's know. okay. You said goodbye, <laughs> that's the main thing. <laughs>